Ah, interesting. Guys, do BC a solid if you don't mind. Well, two things. First and foremost, on your way in, smash that up. Help out the algo. It also allows BC to know you guys are amplified for today's review and podcast. So give that like button a stunner or a leg drop, brother. A uh, Canadian destroyer or a Batista bomb. Put it into the sharpshooter. Make the like button tap out. <laughs> Whatever you do, smash it. Let me know you're amplified and ready to go. Help out that algo. That's first and foremost. Second thing, BC has a conundrum. I'm conflicted when I look at the SummerSlam card. There's many matches you have to be careful on the finish. The finish means everything for a lot of these matches this Saturday night in Detroit. But there's one match in particular that BC's looking at, and that's where the conundrum kicks in. Logan Paul versus Ricochet. BC is not so sure who and how I have wrestler A or B go over. So this is where I send it to you guys. I'm going to put my amplified unit to work. (laughs) And my gold team, my channel members, you don't have an option. You have to participate. (laughs) Because this is... This is why you're channel members, man. When BC is conflicted or I have a conundrum, we take it to the board. And you guys now have to give your input. If you're head of creative or you're the agent for the match, the head booker, and you have a lot of say and a lot of pull, Ricochet versus Logan Paul, who do you, who, who, who do you have coming out of Detroit, coming out of SummerSlam as the winner, the victor, and who do you have losing? You may say Ricochet has to win this match. He's been a residential jobber, hell, even mayor of Jobberville for years in WWE. BC, Ricochet has to win, especially against a part-timer like Logan Paul. Okay, I can see that logic. Ricochet needs a big W on a big stage. However, look at what that does for the opposition. Logan Paul now collects another L. I believe that's all he's collected since he came to WWE. He took a massive L to Roman Reigns, huge L to Sethington Rollins, mega L at Money in the Bank, and now he takes another L to Ricochet. So he went the distance with Roman Reigns, one of the better matches of that calendar year. Went the distance with Sethington Rollins. Many times in both those matches, nearly pulling out the pinfall. And Ricochet beats him. I'm asking. See, this is the logic. On the flip side, if Ricochet loses, he loses another matchup. He finally got spotlight, though. Right? He got a big matchup on a big stage. Sometimes sometimes there's victory in defeat. Is the old saying. Like LA Knight losing to Bray Wyatt at Royal Rumble. BC said don't worry guys. This is only going to help LA Knight. Being in that with Bray Wyatt. And the way that LA Knight and Bray Wyatt work together. And sure enough coming out of that. LA Knight became one of the biggest things in pro wrestling. Coming out of that Bray Wyatt feud. Because that all started there. And then February it started to kick in. WrestleMania he was one of the biggest chants. In Los Angeles. And they left him off the show. That's another story. They left him off many shows. That's a whole nother podcast. But the point is. This is a situation at times in pro wrestling. Sometimes there is victory and defeat. Ricochet easily could be in that position. So it's not like it's the end of the world. Ricochet loses. A lot of people say no. This has to be it. Logan Paul losing seems to be much more detrimental. Especially because he's part-time. How do you have this guy keep coming back every couple months? Talking a big game and he can't even beat mid-carters now. It's a conundrum. Ricochet, Logan Paul. Man, they both need a W. I feel one can do without for one big more go-around. And that is Ricochet. But I don't know, man. Down below, a lot of people just don't want to see Logan Paul even in WWE. So they're just saying, BC, Ricochet needs to win. (laughs) Bottom line, that's it. 
Let me know down below, guys, if you don't mind. It takes a second, or two seconds. Smash the up, give me a name down below. Ricochet, Logan Paul, who do you have going over? Who needs the W more? What would it do for them going forward? Ricochet's lost a million matches beforehand. Is one more on a big stage going to really hurt? Maybe, because it's Logan Paul, people say. Let me know down below. Now, in this Amped Up podcast for Tuesday, no, 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 yes, it is Tuesday, but it's August 1st, man, a whole new month. Salute to that. Made it into August. We're going to feature the Monday Night Raw review from last night, and wait till you hear what happened on this show. Guys, two mega matches were pulled from SummerSlam. I have the updated card, and they shrunk it down even further. Two big matches. One of them was a championship match, a title match. And the other one was a feud that's been going for months. Wait till you hear the two matches that they pulled. And why a lot of the wrestling community, especially females, are pissed. <laughs> man, it's not pretty out there in the wrestling world, man. And uh, many believe it's justified. Um... It's justified the complaints. We'll talk about it. Two big matches removed from the SummerSlam card. We'll talk about it in this podcast. We're also going to talk Ricochet Logan Paul because they started the show last night. Wait till you hear this segment. I actually thought it was well done. What? BC thought a Raw segment was very well done? I think so. We'll talk about it. Flip Flops Flanagan. Matthew Riddle. Uh, loses again, this time to Ludwig Kaiser. We'll talk about if WWE has given up on flip-flops Flanagan, or if they just don't know what to do with them, or option C, they're just waiting for Randy Orton. Oh, pump the brakes on that, please. We'll discuss it in this podcast. Maxine Dupree wins her first matchup. Wait till you hear how she did it. Um, mommy, Rhea Ripley getting some love from Houston, Texas. Dominic Mysterio, not so much. We'll talk about it. Ronda Rousey, Shayna Baszler. Last night, they were used in the best way I've seen them both used since they both got to the main roster. Last night, something happened with a Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler two segments that actually had BC captivated. And here's the kicker. They weren't even used on the show arena-wise. So if you didn't see the show, you're like, whoa, 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 BC, it's the best that Ronda has looked and the best that Shayna has looked since they got to the main roster and they weren't even at the arena? They weren't even on the show in that aspect? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Wait till you hear what they did with Ronda and Shayna last night. Tommaso Ciampa gets pinned in the most dumbfounding of ways... Nowhere near the realm of belie believability. Love Shinsuke Nakamura. But Tommaso losing that way, that's a big uh-uh, as Stone Cold would say. Cowboy Brock Lesnar once again snaps the arm or breaks the arm of Cody Rhodes. It's become a running joke now. Every time Brock shows up, Cody's arm's getting broke. Uh, we'll go over that as well. Gunther and Chad Gable should have been really special, but they threw a massive gimmick on it for no reason. We'll talk about it. And uh, main event, Damian Priest goes to cash in. Finn Balor turns into Frozen Man. <laughs> Cost Damian Priest the cash in, adding to future tension that is sure going to be there at SummerSlam this Saturday night. All of this and a lot more. It's all going to be discussed in today's Amped Up podcast, Tuesday, August the 1st, 2023. Happy August to all my Amplified unit out there. And this podcast will be featuring the entire Monday Night Raw review. We'll also go over super thanks, super chats from yesterday's NXT review. I did put up a review for NXT. Pretty cool. I don't usually review any show that does not pull a million viewers consistently because that just tells BC there's not a big enough audience uh, that wants to see those shows, so not many people would want to see reviews on it. But once in a while, I'll do an AEW review or an NXT review, even though both shows do not pull a million viewers, at least not consistently. 
Um, so I did NXT. So that tells me maybe I will do uh, AEW's All In later this month. I did NXT. I might as well do an AEW review as well. So a couple of bonus reviews for my Amplified unit, showing that appreciation right back to every single one of you guys, man. Uh, that shows that love and appreciation, respect to the channel. Smashing the up, whether you leave a comment or you just watch in support, right? Salute, honestly, guys. Um, those bonus reviews, that's for you guys. So for those that did catch the NXT review, salute, man. Uh, I know it was a little shorter, obviously. It's an NXT. I almost called it TakeOver. Great American Bash, but... It's a pretty solid review, man. BC's amplified thoughts on it. And uh, from the looks of it, you guys really enjoyed that. So maybe there will be more in the future. We'll see. All right. Let BC get a massive swig here, and we'll get this Monday Night Raw review started. 7 31 23, last day of July. Monday Night Raw. Did it end with straight fire, or did it fizzle out by the time July ended? Let's talk about it right now. Opening sequence, we're just going to get right into this show, guys. So we're going to hold off on the lightning bolts and get right into Raw 731-23. Logan Paul starts this show. Massive heat, legit booze, not piped in. <laughs> not piped in, that's the key. Now, is it up to the Dominic Mysterio status of booze in heel heat? No. But for Logan Paul to be in the game as short amount of time as he has been to collect that type of a reaction. Guys, there's wrestlers that have been training for years, have been doing this for years, and plan on doing it for years more. And they could only wish to get heat like that. It is an art. It's a natural ability. You have to have what is called an it factor. Literally, there, there, there was a dude, Big Cass. You guys probably forgot him. They were Enzo and Big Cass. And he's actually over All Elite Wrestling now. But Big Cass was with Enzo in a tag team. And they had this shtick, right? Bada bing, bada boom, realist guys in the room. And this right here, Enzo would say, this is Big Cass. And he's seven foot tall and you can't teach that. This is one of those things where you just can't teach that. That it factor is either in you or it's not. And that's in anything, right? There's been people that have tried to be really amazing chefs. And they're just not good at it. There's people that really want to be the best guitar player on the planet. They want three or four bands at the same time. One problem. They're just not good on the guitar. They practice and they train and they, you name it. They do fucking their thing. They're training their fingers every morning and they're practicing every single day, evening and night in those garages. Do some more finger therapy at night before bed. Wake up, repeat the process. They're just not a great guitar player. Not even that good. There's podcasters. They really want to do it. They really think they're good. They're going to try. And it's pretty evident they're just not good at it. They ain't got the gift to gab. They're not entertaining. They're really weird. It's bad. It's really bad. Right? You just know you got it or you don't. It's an it factor. In professional wrestling, so many people want to be that big star. There's just one problem. They don't have the it factor. Sadly, today's pro wrestlers, over 90% of them look like they're a carbon copy of one another, all being dished out of the Amazon distribution center. They're all the same on an assembly line being dished out to any promotion that's going to sign them. There's wrestler A, wrestler B, wrestler C, wrestler D, wrestler E. They got their trunks, their boots. They're all the same size these days. Most of them haven't even hit a gym. <laughs> Muscles? Why? I can do a Huracarana Super 470 splash like I did on the trampoline growing up. So, this it factor, you just can't teach it. Logan Paul, it was clear. Match one with Roman Reigns. It was clear. Whoa, this dude gets it. The mic work, a little shaky at first. Something happened after the Sethington feud and matchup. He started to get it more. He started to realize you control the crowd. 
as long as your name is in their mouths, it doesn't matter if they're booing you. It doesn't matter if people in life love you or hate you. As long as you get them to react, you are up here, they're down here. That's just the way it is. If you are making people react, you are up here, they're down here. There's nothing you can do. That's the way it is. It is a beautiful thing when you control the room. You have it, palm of your hands. That type of reaction you do not get in professional wrestling unless you have the it factor. You are somebody that is polarizing. You are somebody that they take the time to give you their energy. They took the time to give you their energy. Too many times. How often do you guys see matches going on or promos, interviews, and fans are sitting down? Crickets in the arena. They don't care. Eh, get it over with. To give you that type of reaction, whether you like or love Logan Paul or can't stand him or hate him, I'm pretty sure he don't care. He gets the reaction. He's got you talking about him. He's got you booing him loudly. That is awesome. That is awesome for Logan Paul, man. That was so cool to see that reaction because aside from Dominic Mysterio, Nobody else gets that amount of booze in WWE. Austin Theory, they're still piping it in. So it says says a lot about Logan Paul already, and he hasn't even won a match, guys. He just loses them all. Roman, Sethington, Money in the Bank. And you say, well, BC, he's got no business beating any of them. You're right. <laughs> You're right. But he's been in them. And he's delivered every time. I feel he shouldn't have even been in Money in the Bank. It doesn't suit him. He's much better one-on-one -on -one showcasing what he can deliver, man, with somebody else that can do the same. So I didn't like the Money in the Bank thing, but he went in, did his best, had the botch with Ricochet, and they still pulled off a maneuver somehow. But he says at SummerSlam, he and Rico will be the most viral match in history. What does that mean? Are you going to pull off a Canadian destroyer from atop the stadium? You know, they're really pumping this thing up to be a wild spot fest type of a match. Careful with that. You don't want to raise the expectations so high. Once you've seen a Vikingo versus Kenny Omega match, you know, where do you go from there as a fan base? As a spot fest match, you got to relax the expectations. Have a good match with spots in it. Really good ones that we will then talk about afterwards. Don't pump it up pump it up like it's going to be a spot fest with a side order of match. No, the main course of this meal should be match with a side order of kick-ass spot fests. All right, kick-ass spots in the match. So you want to go back to that restaurant and have those appetizers. Again, I get it. But just have a good match. If you focus too much on all the spots, you could rush it. You could absolutely lose the match to the point where it becomes sloppy. Then we are talking about botches overshadowing how good the match truly was. And we don't want to do that. I'm glad they're working on some really cool spots. But keep that to yourselves. Just pump up the match. The spots will be the cherry on top. Or that really kick-ass appetizer. Or appetizers with an S. If you're like BC, I eat a lot. I go to a restaurant, I'm ordering 12 appetizers and four main course meals. And put the Sunday on the side. Don't you skimp out on that cherry. Put it on top. <laughs> so he's saying that this is going to be the most viral match ever. Telling you this is going to be the biggest spot fest type of match. But relax. We understand it's Ricochet, Logan, Paul. There's going to be cool spots. Don't raise the expectations where they don't need to be to the point where you're not going to be able to deliver to those expectations. That's where BC's concern would be on that. Now, Rico does come down to the ring. There was actually a Ricochet chant. Now, I can't recall. Guys, all honesty. No shade, because I'm telling you that was really cool to hear. I cannot recall Ricochet getting a Ricochet chant on the main roster. Maybe when he first debuted and people were excited. Oh, wow, this is going to be special. And then we saw his booking for the last couple of years and he just became a residential 
Jobber, mayor of Jobberville. So I cannot recall an actual ricochet chant on the main roster, aside from maybe the time frame he debuted. So for him to get a ricochet chant, pretty special. And that shows you the heel heat that Logan Paul is truly connecting with. So Rico comes to the ring. He gets that chant. He gets that love. Logan then says, and I quote, Logan Paul says right to Ricochet. He says, that ring announcer right there, Samantha Irvin, that's your fiance, right? I hope there's no hard feelings when after our match at SummerSlam, your girl says, and the winner is Logan Paul. This doesn't sit well, obviously, with Ricochet. So Rico and Logan start a mini brawl between the two that acted more as a teaser for their SummerSlam match more than a brawl. And what I mean by that is like a a movie trailer or a preview to a movie. This was like a mini match before their SummerSlam match. It was roughly 90 seconds, but it was like a match. They were actually doing moves and springboards and ducking and clotheslines instead of a brawl. It started off with a takedown, but after that, it was... Yeah, it, it was a it was a different... It, it, was, a, it was a wild wrestling type of... 90 seconds, not just a brawling 90 seconds. It was an intense 90 seconds between the two. Um, so it just teased the match. That, that, that's, I just like how it was done. You know, I didn't want to see just a brawl. We're already seeing that with Cody and Brock every time Brock shows up. Judgment Day in Sethington always is just some type of a brawl. Everything now is just a brawl. Zoe and Trish are going to brawl with Becky. We understand. Liv Morgan, Raquel, they're just going to get brawled out and destroyed backstage or in the ring. We get it. Brawl, 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 brawl because there's no real storytelling being done at play. So, the fact that they actually gave you a teaser, man, that was a that was a good 90 seconds. That's what she said. <laughs> but uh, salute, man. I, I thought the whole thing was well done. Logan Paul, Ricochet, they had some good chemistry. The past couple of weeks with their mic work with one... I mean, Ricochet has upped it, bro. I've been harsh on Ricochet for this, Right? Everybody thinks they can do it, and they, 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 they don't know how to work the mic. They, they just, they're, they're not good on the microphone. And Ricochet's big Achilles heel is the microphone. He doesn't speak up. He doesn't have the voice for it. There's no amplification. There's no fun to it. There's no purpose to what he's saying. This Logan Paul feud, man, it is just... It's doing wonders for Ricochet. And it goes back to my question earlier. Who wins this match? I feel Ricochet can lose this and still gain a lot from it. Victory and defeat. However, I totally understand Ricochet pulling an upset. And I do look at it as an upset because of what Logan did with Roman in Sethington, guys. Look at those matches. How many times he almost beat the Tribal Chief and Sethington, both your champions, and Logan Paul not only went the distance, almost defeated them. So yeah, I mean, if Logan can hang with those dudes and Ricochet hasn't even sniffed those dudes, you can look at that as an upset. But it, I will have no problem if it's done properly. If Ricochet goes over Logan Paul, I just, man, at what point do you have Logan Paul win a match? That would be the thing, because by the time he has his next match... Um, maybe more closer to the holidays. He'll be with WWE over a year, correct? Almost anyway. I mean, I think his Roman Reigns match maybe was last November-ish. September, October, somewhere around there. So he'd been there a full year and he he will not have a victory under his belt. That's where you got to kind of be, you got to think about that. Too many people like to Monday morning quarterback or think they're a good booker because they can just pick winners. You have to think about the trajectory of the loser as well. That's what BC likes to do. I like to think a mile ahead. It makes me, what I am on this channel, really good at what I do. Right? It's because I do my due diligence. I get my ducks in a row. I'm thinking not just what the winner, what it'll do for him, but what it'll do for he or she loser going forward. Man, 
As you can tell, I'm excited for this match, Logan Paul versus Ricochet, but I also don't know where they go with the finish, and I don't want them to screw it up, man. But we'll leave it at excited for this match. Whenever you hear BC say I'm actually excited for a pay-per-view match, that'll tell you something, man. They're doing something right. So that was the start of the show, Logan Paul Ricochet. Very well done segment, I felt. Then we went into Ludwig Geyser versus Flip Flops Flanagan. Matthew P.H. Riddle. A vanilla latte with no vanilla. I love when they do that, by the way, right? It's my fourth coffee, so I don't really care. It was just going to be a little treat, a little cheat for BC before I go. Um, What is today? Delts. Delt day. So before I go to the gym, you know, you put a little vanilla into the latte. It's all good. No, they t- it says vanilla. And they didn't put vanilla. It's just a straight latte, but I love it. It's it's all good. I just love when I order something and I don't get it. Speaking of delts, did you guys... Oh, you know what? I'm going to hold off till I get to the judgment. Rhea Ripley. Oh, we're going to talk Rhea Ripley and delts, guys, when we get over to the judgment day. I think that's hour number two. We'll go, go left field with a hockey stick here. Let's stick to the script here, BC. Ludwig Kaiser versus Flip Flops Flanagan. <laughs> Ludwig wins clean over Flip Flops Flanagan via the modified Blade Runner, I'm told. Truth be told, I went to re-up on my coffee. When I came back, the match was over. So I had to do a quick little check-in with one of my good buddies, and he just said modified Blade Runner. I, I don't, you guys can confirm that down below, or maybe it was something totally different. I didn't have the time to get more info. Like, what? Off of how? How did he get the modified Blade Runner? I didn't have time for that. So that's what I just took his word for, put it down. But um, that's what I got. I actually saw the whole match, missed the finish, had to re-up on the coffee. Um, my bad. But post-match, I did see Ludwig earning the massive respect from Gunther, who has not been so high on Ludwig lately. Feels like he's kind of letting down Imperium, making them look lesser than. So after that victory over Flip Flops Flanagan, Ludwig was a lot more receptive to Ludwig, right? Gunther was a lot more receptive to Ludwig. Sticks out his hand, Ludwig gets that affirmation, that respect back from Gunther, big smile, and all is right in Imperium world. Uh, very cool. Now, with Matthew Riddle, all right, the company is either completely lost with Riddle or has given up on Riddle. Or option three, they're just waiting for Randy Orton. No, please. It's bad enough that you're sticking Drew Snooze entire. Dude, we respect, but it's sad. Drew McIntyre doesn't move a needle because he's just not booked the right way. He went away for a while. When he came back, we were hoping we were going to care, right? Turn heel in the UK, in London, turn heel on Sethington, set up something big for SummerSlam or beyond. Uh, No, he just came back, went right for the same title he was involved with before he left. Gunther's mid-card IC title. And then they had him strangely just pairing up with Flip Flops Flanagan, Matt Riddle, making jokes about going and going to the bar or going to the supermarket and they're going to have fun, bro. I'm like, w- Drew is now just a comedy act this soon after he just returned. I, I-, I told you guys that this may be a worse booked Drew McIntyre than before he left. And there was so many high expectations for Drew when he came back. So that's bad enough. If you're telling me that all this time for Orton being off was just for Orton to come back and reform RK Bro, I hope not. I hope when Orton comes back, because now his, as far as wrestling, the time is limited because of his back, right? He's going to have to retire sooner rather than later, unfortunately. I hope that time is well spent and used properly. I hope he turns on Matthew Riddle. And I hope that he goes and be, be, bees that, that legend killer, that viper that we all want to see. He's more than that. He's a singles competitor. A lot of people say, well, BC, because of certain injuries, he's better in a tag team. He doesn't have to use that amount, the same amount of energy as like a, a singles match. He still got injured. He still got injured. And he's got nothing to show for it other than an RK bro tag team a full year before he got injured. You could just limit his matches. That's all. 
Edge wrestles a couple times a year. Logan Paul wrestles a couple times a year. Randy Orton can wrestle a few times a year. And he's smart. He doesn't have to do spot fest every match. Half of his matches can be literally brawl style and people just want to see that character in the ring. It's the reason people like Ultimate Warrior got over back in the day. One of the biggest wrestlers of all time is a guy that many would tell you is not even that good of a wrestler. Like... Skill-wise, technically. But he was always one of the most over. You didn't want to see Warrior go in there and do Canadian Destroyers. Back then, you didn't know what a Canadian Destroyer was, but you didn't want to see Warrior do a Huracarana. You went in there to see the... You bought your ticket, or you bought the pay-per-view, or you watched Saturday night's main event as a little kid at midnight. You stayed up because, A, your parent let you, <laughs> or you were not getting up uh, to watch that. But you, you watch The Ultimate Warrior because you wanted to see him hit the shoulder tackle, hit the big press, and celebrate by shaking those ropes. So, you, you know, Randy Orton will be just fine as a singles. He doesn't need to be in a tag team to protect his back. Uh, pro wrestling. Hulk Hogan, toward the end of his career especially, I mean, he protected his back, his legs, his hips. Everything was hurting. But Hogan went years more. Watch his style in those matches. It's not that far off from the Hogan we knew in the 80s and 90s. But still, you protect your style. You alter it. You call the audibles that are necessary, and you kick ass. Undertaker Mark Calloway says all the time, people just want him to come back just to deliver a, a choke slam and a tombstone. And, and they'll watch him four or five times a year, or at least once a year at WrestleMania. And Taker says, no, I just wouldn't feel right about it. But the fans are like, that's all we need to see. <laughs> So, you know, when Orton comes back, guys, I hope he's not just dancing around in a tag team with flip-flops Flanagan. It's okay if he comes back, helps him at first, and then it turns into a turn. But Randy Orton is capable of so much more, and I really want to see it. Um, because he's just one of the most finessed wrestlers you're ever going to witness in this professional wrestling game. I say it the same thing with AEW's Dustin Rhodes. Randy Orton, Dustin Rhodes. They're the most finessed wrestlers. There is just a fluency and a flawlessness to them when they wrestle. And it helps when they both do that scoop slam. When the wrestler B's hitting the ropes and Dustin or Randy's ready for that tilt-a-whirl scoop slam. And I'm just like, oh, nobody does it more beautiful than Dustin and Randy. So I don't know what they're doing with Matthew Riddle, but I gotta tell you, there's no connection at all. So I can't tell you that I'm... I'm pissed at all that Flip Flops is not getting proper booking or he's not winning the majority of his matches or he's not involved in a big storyline. I'm not upset at all. There's no connection anyway. Until they get this... Do I always said that a serious Matt Riddle is best for business and more importantly, best for Matthew Riddle. Serious. I don't like the jokester. It's fun once in a blue moon, I guess. But you just can't take them seriously. I took Doink the Clown more serious than Flip Flops Flanagan. I don't know what they're doing with them, but I hope they find out. Because there's already no connection to Matt Riddle as far as caring. I hope that does change, man. I hope we can care about what he's doing. Or they're just holding off until Randy comes back. They're either going to be in a tag team or they're going to have Randy turn on him. But either way... They're going to wait on Matthew Riddle until Randy comes back to make a decision. In which case, this dude's just going to have to keep on trying to swim the shore. Don't sink. Maxine Dupree. Wait till you hear this one. Her debut wrestling match singles competition. And she wins. Maxine Dupree defeats Van Halen. At least that's what I call her. One of my favorite bands. But this Van Halen, <laughs> it's a, uh, ooh, her booking's a little shaky. Just like the Vikings that she manages. Maxine Dupree defeats Van Halen via pinfall from a backdrop bridge combo. Ocean Cyclone Suplex is, I believe, what this is called. A Japanese Ocean Cyclone Suplex. I believe that's what that was. Um, I'll just stick with backdrop bridge combo, right? But, but it's modified backdrop anyway. It's not a straight up backdrop. All right, just stick with Japanese. Um, I, I don't even know what it's called. Japanese ocean cyclone suplex. Just stick with that. 
Because there's a hundred different backdrops. I'm not trying to confuse you any more than the show is. <laughs> but the point is, it was pretty badass in the athleticism of Maxine with the bridge part at the end of the cyclone suplex. Man, that was pretty badass. So, great W for Dupree on her debut singles competitional match. You have to question the credibility now of Van Halen, though. As much as BC loves the band, this Van Halen just lost clean to Maxine. Dupree! <laughs> um, and by the way, Maxine's Caterpillar. Guys, what in the world? It's funny. Keep doing it. <laughs> we love it. We don't know what to take from it or what to... We, we don't know how to take it, I should say. Her Caterpillar, guys... When Maxine tries to do the Otis Caterpillar, uh, Otis has been kind of shaky with it lady, b lately, but when Maxine does it, she honestly, she looks like a demented dolphin having a seizure and a panic attack simultaneously. Like a demented dolphin. She starts shaking, and then as she's shaking, she's like moving her, sh and her face, something happens to her face, and then as she's shaking... Her feet start to waddle toward the turnbuckle. They're, they're like waddling and shaking to the turn. And when she gets there, something takes over again and she just starts to... Whoa! That's a lot to take in from Maxine. That's all I'll say. It's funny. Keep doing it. It's working. Crowd seems to enjoy it. BC was enthralled. I didn't know what I was watching. <laughs> I didn't know. I was like, is she okay? Somebody throw up the X. It's an in-ring panic attack slash siege. I didn't know, man. She, something's taken over, man. I was like, she took all the caffeine, man. Back in the day, it's a funny story. Macho Man, back in the 80s, they tell a story. Ultimate Warrior and Macho Man, they would take the basically the big canister it's like a keg of coffee basically and they have it for all the you know, catering they would take the entire keg of coffee and they would bring it to their separate locker room and lock it so they would take all the coffee warrior and macho man took all the coffee <laughs> and it's kind of funny because that's how you you know if you know macho man and ultimate warrior and how they were it kind of makes sense before they came out they were uh yeah, they were caffeinated up. Maybe other things as well, but they were definitely caffed up. So anyway, Maxine Dupree looks to be taking all the coffee. Hopefully she's sharing some with Gable because Gable put on one heck of a performance last night. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, a couple minutes, actually. I think that was hour three. We're still in hour number one. This was the end of hour one, Maxine Dupree. But uh, man, that caterpillar, bro. Uh, it's, it's something. I'll leave it at that. It's a show beforehand. You got to see her just start to something is happening. It's like it's like Stranger Things, you know, or Stranger Things over on. What is that? Netflix and something like takes over them and they start to shake. <laughs> Fucking Maxine. Who would have thought this Maxine is what we'd be getting just months ago, just a few months ago. Last month, who would have thought this Maxine is what we'd get? Definitely funny. That was the end of hour number one, guys. So a quick recap. Paul, Logan Paul, Ricochet uh, do their little thing at the top of the show, set up their SummerSlam match some more. Ludwig Kaiser defeats Flip Flops Flanagan, Matthew P.H. Riddle, and Maxine Dupree defeats Van Halen. Van Halen! And that's your hour number one. So we go on to hour number two. We're going to start off with the Judgment Day. So, Judgment Day starts hour number two. Rhea, man, she got some love from Houston, Texas. She got some love from that crowd, man. There was mommy chants pretty loudly. Dominic Mysterio, on the other hand, booed out of Texas completely. <laughs> Great heel heat. There's been some calls that Dominic has been getting some piped-in boos to make it even more amplified. It's possible. I didn't. I don't hear them per se, but it's possible. Um, it's not needed though, guys. He's already getting really good, genuine heel heat. Like it is matching a lot of those boos. It's matching with the crowd. That's what you look for. Like Austin Theory, you clearly see it's not matching up. The boos are so loud and everyone's sitting down, not doing anything. 
it's clearly piped in. And then you just hear the audible, the static within. If you know what you're listening for, you know. But with uh, Dominic, it's at least matching up. Um, it, they, they maybe just want to amplify it even more. You know, they, they can never get enough of a good thing. If something works in WWE, they will beat it down till it's completely fucking irrelevant. Like Sethington Rollins' oh song, right? I mean, I have to mute the TV now when they're doing that stupid oh oh for Sethington. I can't do it. it it's nauseating because they just, it's too redundant. They, it's too long now. Move on. Um, but sometimes you just, you try to amplify what is working. You try to make it even better, right? I say about Alex Rodriguez all the time. You know, he's not going to be in the hall of fame. He got suspended for X amount of weeks, months, years, whatever it was. Alex Rodriguez cheated, right? He took the roids. He tried to hit more homers than maybe he should have been. But people forget Alex Rodriguez was already going to be in the Hall of Fame without any extracurricular activity being put in him. Alex Rodriguez was already one of the best baseball players before he was cheating. He just wanted to be even better by any means necessary. Lance Armstrong, the bicyclist, he was always going to be one of the best cyclists uh, known to mankind. He was always going to be one of the best. Was he going to win seven Tour de France's? Probably not. But one, maybe two, possibly. But he wanted to be even better than that. And he cheated and whatnot. And they, we know what happened. Got caught, got suspended. But, you know, these were people that were already really great. And they just didn't know when to leave well enough alone. And they tried to do too much. And it backfired. You know, WWE could be doing that with Dominic Mysterio's. It's such organically awesome heel heat. Let's pipe in a little bit more. Let's make it louder until you get caught. And people are like, wait, that was piped in. And then it has a reverse effect and backfires. I hope that's not the case. But this looks to be very legit still, guys. Dominic Mysterio booed out of Texas. Why, mommy is getting all the love. And speaking of, I told you guys that delt. I gave you guys that delt teaser. Because today's Delt Day for BC after we record. They had, when Judgment Day came out last night, top of hour two. You know how they have their little, they're all standing shoulder to shoulder at the top of the ramp. It's dark. You got the blue slash purple spotlight on them. Guys, the biggest person out of the four. No joke. You could see the visual last night if you, if you, if you possibly come across it. The biggest person, muscle-wise, was Rhea Ripley. The, the delts, the delts, one particular, the delts, man, they're shoulder to shoulder in Rhea's delts. One delt is on the East Coast. It, it's chilling in the Florida Peninsula. The other delt is chilling out in San Diego, California on the West Coast. Those delts were banging out. Finn Balor, much more smaller, obviously, not a big gym guy. Works the abs, though. Doesn't eat a damn donut in his lifetime, I believe, with those fucking abs. But everything else, pretty smaller, dude. Dominic Mysterio, not a big gym guy, obviously. Damien, height, not huge with the gym. Delts, much smaller than Rhea's. Rhea Ripley is like, I mean, you saw the silhouette. That's the best word, right? When they when they start to zoom in and you just see the silhouette of all of Judgment Day. And Rhea Ripley looks like she's about to take on China. Wild, man. Wild. Her delt days must be insane. It's, it's one of my favorite gym days, delts. I just love it. You know, you walk into a Starbucks, somebody's too close to you, you're going to put them into a wall, right? I love it. You're too close. That's the warning, right? My delt put you into the wall. Any closer, I'm literally going to put you through the wall. Delt day. It's huge. For those of you gym rats in there, or you're just starting off in the gym, delts, guys. Build those delts up, man. That's the, the base of the powerhouse, all right? That's the base, the foundation. Um, get those delts bumping out. Um, Rhea Ripley, I had, to, I had to talk about those delts. That was wild. I, 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 who's she dating? Murphy, right? Murphy from AEW. Matthews. <laughs> buddy Matthews, Buddy Murphy. Um, 
I, I, I don't know. He's a gym dude. I, I wonder if, uh, who's got the delts in that house. Who's 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 busting those delts more? They probably have delt competitions, bro. All right. Anyway, Rhea Ripley. I mean, she is becoming a powerhouse for the ages, bro. I said a while back, I don't put her in a league of China because I don't put anybody in the league of China. China is her own beast and she should be. There's nobody. There's nothing you can do. Raquel Rodriguez. There's not a Rhea Ripley. There's nobody. There's not a Jade Cargill. Guys, you guys know how high I am on some of these ladies, but it's there's just not some. There nobody is in the league of China. It's a different stratosphere. But man, if Rhea keeps like rocking the gym the way she is and booking really backs her properly, I could be like, man, China versus Rhea Ripley. Could you imagine? I used to say that about Beth Phoenix. Beth Phoenix was one of the closest ones. I'd say China, Beth Phoenix. Anyway, Dominic getting some good heel heat. Mommy getting some love. Um, bro, I got to say this too. Be be one more thing on this. All right, because uh, uh, Rhea's delts and then Dominic. I have to speak on this. Dominic Mysterio, bro, I got to say, he is looking more and more like Eddie Guerrero by the week. The hair bra. The hair bra. Maybe it's just the I don't know. Every week I see die every show because he's so over he's even on NXT now, carries the North American title. Guys, you look at Dominic Mysterio, he looks like Eddie Guerrero. And it's hilarious because they actually had a storyline way, way back. Many of you guys, some of you guys maybe not even born yet. Dominic was like a, a little kid, man, like little kid. And they did a storyline where like Eddie is his real father. Storyline completely. And, and we're not questioning that either. It's just, wow, does he? Now, I don't know if he's trying to do it on purpose because the hair is almost identical now. To Eddie Guerrero. So maybe he's doing it on purpose. But with the hair and the facial features, I can't help but think Eddie Guerrero, man. And maybe it's because I do recall that storyline. I don't know. It's just wild. Anyway, back to the segment now that I got all the side topics out of the way. Smiling sensation. The smiling sensation herself, Raquel Rodriguez. But I call her the smiling sis. She's always smiling. Right? She's like Cody Rhodes. There's <laughs> nothing wrong in the world. Everything's peaches. I wake up. We're shitting rainbows. I look up. The fucking planes and clouds and birds are dropping chocolate chip. Mushy, smushy, soft batch cookies. <laughs> oh, man. Everything's hunky-dory. Smiling sensation Raquel Rodriguez. She storms to the ring, and I'm not sure what she was trying to accomplish because she just got derailed by Rhea Ripley and subse subsequently received a storyline leg injury. It was kind of already in the process. They took out Liv, obviously, with her injury, and then Raquel was always getting beat up. Well, this is a, an injury that backstage Adam Pearce said, I cannot allow you to have your match at SummerSlam. I don't even know if that was an official match anyway, but it was looking that way. It was pretty clear that's where they were going. And Adam Pierce said, I cannot give you that match. But when you are cleared, the second you're cleared, I will give you that match. So, guys, what I'm telling you, no joke, at least as of the recording of this podcast, featuring this Raw review from last night, one of the biggest matches that was supposed to be at SummerSlam because it's a women's title match, Rhea Ripley versus Raquel Rodriguez, has been scrapped from the books, has been pulled from the card, has gotten Das Boot, Das Boot from SummerSlam. How wild is that? Now, I was never down for Raquel versus Rhea at SummerSlam anyway. Truth be told, nothing against Raquel. It's just, it's not a SummerSlam match to BC. And I know many of you guys. It was rushed out of nowhere. Raquel's just been in tag team since basically she came to the main roster. And everybody just gets injured. We always talk about it. Shotzi got injured twice as a tag team partner for her. Liv Morgan now injured twice, tag team partner to her. Aaliyah, tag team with Raquel, got injured. And they just keep throwing new people in with her. Or for the second time in the case of Liv and Shotzi. And they keep getting injured. And now Raquel, they're just like, let's give a storyline injury to Raquel now. Screw it. But there was nothing in Raquel's booking that would call for her to have a match with Rhea at SummerSlam. Definitely not a feud. 
In fact, it got so weird that Rhea, every week on Raw, was going up to Raquel and going, I thought I told you to stay out of my business. There's just one problem. She was. Raquel was never getting into any Judgment Day business. So I think writing, writing creative finally got the, the hint like, wait, that doesn't make sense. BC's actually right. So they finally scrapped that, and it looks like they just scrapped the entire match. I can't say this is... I can't say that this is a a detriment to the SummerSlam card in the form of the match itself, in that aspect. In the aspect of the ladies being pulled, that's a massive deal. Because something happened uh, hour three. Uh, we'll talk more about this when we go over hour three in just a few minutes. Because another match got scrapped and pulled from the card. Das booted from SummerSlam. And this is what sent a lot of the wrestling community in a tilt a whirl. So we're going to go over that. So remember this. This match pulled, and it's a massive title match that was going to be on the card. Wait till you hear what they did in hour three. We'll go over that. First, let's continue on with hour number two. So again, we start hour two, Raquel is injured, and she is taken out of SummerSlam. We then had a pre-tape package um, hyping up Ronda Rousey versus Shayna Baszler at SummerSlam. Now we know it is MMA rules, MMA fight more than a wrestling match. We had a video package play, and it was, listen to this, man, because this, this has to do with Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler. So you're, you're going to say, well, BC, did you just say what you just said about Shayna and Ronda? Yes, listen to this. It was freaking awesome. It was awesome. In-depth personal interviews with Baszler and Rousey and their past relationship and what each other meant to one another, how close they truly are or were. And... It left BC wanting to see a full documentary on their past and their relationship. I wanted to see a full documentary. I didn't want just four minutes because it was over two different segments, guys. Part one, and then it said to be continued, and then in part th uh, hour three, they did part two. And I'm like, screw these little four to five minute parts. Give me an hour and a half. This is intriguing. So how ironic that this was the best I've seen Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler used since they got to the roster. You could say Shayna winning the Elimination Chamber a few years ago, how she did it. That would be the only other thing. Ronda Rousey's big uh, WrestleMania debut with Kurt Angle over Paul Levesque McMahon and Stephanie McMahon. Yeah, they had their moments. But as far as booking that captivated me, this was the best I've seen Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler since they both debuted on the roster. The main roster. And for Ronda, that's all she knows. Shayna was in NXT. But the main roster, this is the best I've seen them booked. And how ironic, they weren't even at the arena. Or maybe they were. Did the in, in, I think the interviews were done probably last week. It was so edited that they would need a lot more time than just earlier in the day, I would think. I mean, there was tears in these interviews. It was very well thought out and scripted out at times, but done beautifully. Uh, the edit was so good, I have to believe that most of that was done before last night. So, the point is, they weren't even in an in-arena segment, or just backstage cutting interviews. No. And yet, this was the most captivated I've been for Ronda Rousey and Baszler. It was so beautifully, epically done, guys. And it got me way more interested in seeing that match than I was before last night when on the air. Very, very well done. Ronda Rousey, Shayna. Very well done. And this is what I mean. This company knows how to promote their pay-per-view matches and really get us excited and captivated or at least caring. They know. They haven't forgotten how to do it. They just got lazy and they don't do it. That was so well done. Ronda Rousey, Shayna Baszler, man. Wow. Wow. You just, you learned a lot. They were in tears. You felt it. You suspended the disbelief or what I call you suspend the reality. And you enter the, the wild world of wrestling. And you believe what Ronda is saying. You believe what Shayna is saying. Very well done. Up next, we go back a little few. We go back a few steps. Shinsuke Nakamura versus Tommaso Ciampa. This was such an odd match. 
the rhythm was never really established and a commercial break broke up the four minutes that we did see. So you saw a couple minutes, came back, saw a couple minutes more, and the finish was just rough. It did not land with the live crowd, um, nor did it land for most of us for that matter. The finish was that rough. Shinsuke pins Champa via the awe-inspiring, ultra-devastating Farut roll-up. So, and by the way, there was no reaction from the crowd. You can go back, check it out yourself. No reaction from the crowd. It just didn't fit Champa to lose that way. They tried selling the fact that Nakamura was holding on to the tights. But all that did, that replay that they showed in slow motion, it made Champa look even worse. Because it was not believable. Again, Champa, you can have all of it. You can two handfuls of tights. Champa's not losing via roll up. His upper body, the delts on, on Champa, the upper body, the, the, what he puts into his workouts in the core of it, there's no way you can have two handfuls of tights. You ain't pinning him via a roll up. On top of that, the replay in slow motion, Shinsuke's got the side of the tights. So you see Champa waddling. Like he's trying to get out of the roll-up. And I always say that's the saddest part of a fruit roll-up finish. Is that it's just it's so sad to see the wrestler who can clearly get a shoulder just a centimeter off the mat to break the count. Somebody muscular like T- Tommaso or somebody like a giant like Braun Strowman or Bobby Lashley or Omos. Right? We've seen them all get rolled up in the past. How? These are giants. You're telling me they cannot get a sh- their shoulder just a centimeter off the mat? All of this frailing. They can't just do this. And it doesn't have to be a giant. It can be just a, a, a pretty muscular dude like Tommaso. And because Nakamura had the side of the tights, that's what kept Tommaso down. Guys, just not believable. It's, I mean, it's, it's way better off if they didn't even show the replay. Because seeing it live was bad enough. The replay just justified the absurdity in it all. Um, You know, the roll-up, man, there's only two really good places for a roll-up. A straight-up shock finish out of nowhere. Really caught somebody off guard. And you really got to do it beautifully, right? All your body pretty much has to be on the legs, which are pinning down toward, like, the dude's chest. So you're really pinning it. And maybe you got some some tights as well. Okay. Or the other scenario, you've wrestled for like 20, 25, 30 minutes. You're exhausted. You've done everything. And they pull a roll up to the point where you have no energy to even kick out. And all their weight is on you. That's a good scenario for a roll up. Today's wrestling, we see roll ups in four or five minute matches. Two minute matches. Shayna Baszler, we just talked about. For almost two straight years, how does she lose every match? Within two minutes via a roll up. One of the most... One of the actual fighters, one of the toughest actual females in the locker room or in all pro wrestling, Shayna Baszler, and they have her losing via roll-up in two minutes, almost every match for two straight years. It's not believable. That's what we do now. Roll-ups are in four, five-minute matches, one, two-minute matches. All the energy is still with them, and they just can't kick out. It's just not believable. And the bigger problem here is who is being rolled up. Guys like Tommaso Ciampa. Really? Tommaso? You just don't want to see that. He's a real badass dude. Rolled up because some of the tights were in Shinsuke's hands. Man, that was rough to see. I, like, Shinsuke winning a match, you think you'd never... That would never be a bad thing. And that's great for Shinsuke. Collect your W. But whoa, the defeat by Tommaso and how he lost way overshadowed the victory by Shinsuke. Why have the match? Big Brunston Reed is backstage. He's in his suit and he's watching the TV. He could not look any more bored. You could see his eyes from the sunglasses. The glasses are like, the camera was too much to the side. So his eyes are just watching his hands do this more than he was watching the TV. And you say, well, BC, that's by design. He's, he's like getting it. He's excited to take on whoever wins. No, he was literally like falling asleep. 
<laughs> Big Bronson Reed was called into Raw to watch Tommaso and Shinsuke's five minute um, absurdity fest. Uh, man, I, I don't know what that was all for. And, and, and the, what they're doing, Bronson versus Tommaso one week, Bronson versus Shinsuke, Shinsuke, Shinsuke versus Bronson, Shinsuke versus Tommaso. This isn't a feud. This isn't something that we're getting excited about. Every single week, seeing some variation of Big Bronson and Tommaso and Shinsuke. It's not... And then we ended our number two. The Cowboy Brock Lesnar um, is out next. Cowboy... Uh, Cody Chance. I'm sorry. Cody Chance. Greet him immediately. Um... And then Brock reintroduces himself. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Brock Lesnar. And he starts to run down his list of championship credentials. He says, and I quote, If there's one thing I know about championships, it's that this is fight week. Guys, he literally gave a promo about championships last night. I, I sound like a broken record, I understand. I've said this a million times. I'm probably going to have to say this a million more, including right now. WrestleMania's botch when Cody did not walk out as champion. And I told you guys, nothing has made sense since. All right, Roman goes on vacation, has been involved in nothing but tag matches, and now is involved in a bloodline family implosion angle where his tribal lay to be tribal chief of the family is more important than the title itself. Nothing that Roman has done since April calls for him to have the title. Cody Rhodes literally had needed the title because that was the whole reason for the Brock feud. In fact, when they called the Audible, they have since never given a reason as to why Brock Lesnar and Cody are even feuding. And this is about to be a rubber match at the end of summer, or going into August. It'll be August when they have this match finally. Four months of Brock and Cody for no reason. It was always supposed to be for a title on the line. And here we are months later, going into their third match, and Brock Lesnar's promo is about championships, and that this is championship fight week. He was listing down all his champ. If there's one thing I know about championships, that was a quote, this is fight week, talking about for the championship. There's just one problem, Brock. There's no championship on the line. They called it audible. They kept it with Roman. You, you can't you, you can't make it up, man. This is the reality of it, you know? And you try speaking truth, the, pe the, the people don't want to hear it, right? No, oh, man, please, boy. That's not true. <laughs> Anybody with any semblance of common sense and logic will tell you there's no reason for Brock and Cody. In fact, it's, it's turned into a joke. It, it happened again last night, guys. Um, So... Cody Rhodes hits the ring, not smiling. That's a plus. Not smiling. He actually looks like he's going to take on Brock Lesnar for a minute. And Brock basically breaks his arm again. You can't fucking make it up. He takes steel steps and he just starts jamming it into his arm. Cody's really selling it like he broke it again. And then Brock gives him an F5 just for the heck of it. And then he walks off. So Cody gets his arm broken again, basically. It's, it's a running joke. Every right, Brock only works about a, a one Raw a month. And when he shows up, he just breaks Cody's arm again, and then he goes away. It's, it's a running joke. Cody's arm just has gotten broken four times since April. <laughs> it's, that's the storyline, BC. How can you not be into it, right? Okay. So that concludes our number two. To recap, Judgment Day um, takes out Rhea Ripley, and WWE takes out that SummerSlam match. No more Rhea Ripley uh, versus Raquel Rodriguez. Uh, we have an amazing video package play for Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler. Just incredible. Shinsuke Nakamura defeats Tommaso Ciampa via Hold the Tights Fruit Roll-Up. And Cowboy Brock Lesnar basically breaks Cody Rhodes' arm again. That completes our number two. Now we start on our number, number three. Our number three starts in a way where it didn't need to be. But when it was all said and done, it worked itself out. What am I talking about? Let me get a swig. We'll go over our number three. All right, one more swig. Hold on. I gotta get another there, man. Gunther versus Chad Gable. 
starts our number three. Now, this is a five-minute challenge. Gunther says he can beat Gable in less than five minutes. So now we have a clock, and it's a gimmick match. It's actually a shame that we're getting this match last night without any hype. And with such a weird, odd gimmick. Because it's a match that BC actually would like to see with proper time and care put into it. Gable versus Gunther intrigues me. With the time and the care put into it properly. And you you build on it for a couple of months. I'm not asking you to move mountains and wait for pay-per-views. A couple of months. Man, that would be an incredible matchup. With the right amount of hype. So that's what I mean by it's a shame that we had to get it last night, no hype, and with a weird gimmick like a five-minute a five minute clock challenge. Gable ends up going the full five minutes. Gunther demands more time be put on the clock. The match is ordered to continue, and Gunther defeats Gable via pinfall off the Gunther bomb. Post-match, Gunther stands atop the commentary table. Great visual. And he's yelling to the crowd who's booing him. Get used to it. Get used to it. Because Saturday I am not losing the title. And at this point he's looking right into the camera. But he's standing up on the commentary table. It was, it was it just fits him. It was really well done. You know. It, it's almost like a dictator. who's A dictator who's up on a, on a platform. And he's speaking to everybody. Whether they like it or not. This is what's happening. Right. Like a great dictator. This is what's going to happen Saturday, whether you like it or not. So fall in line. Get used to it. You know, it was so well done, man, for Gunther. Um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that on, on an ultra positive note. I thought that was well done. I just wish the man, you could have saved the Gable thing. The, the positive there is that at least people saw Gable and Gunther could be something special in the future still. If they do it properly, I'll absolutely be on board for a rematch. I'll even pay the little subscription fee to watch it on a premium live event pay-per-view. Backstage, Adam Pierce makes an impromptu match between Becky... No, no, not backstage. Trish Str- uh, Becky Lynch was in the ring, calls out Trish Stratus. Trish Stratus and Zoe Stark hit the aisle way. And then Adam Pierce comes out, makes an impromptu match between Becky Lynch and Trish Stratus for right then and there. So not for SummerSlam yet. So you knew there was going to be some type of schmoz and that was going to lead to the SummerSlam match. Well, we were right for half of that. There was a schmoz, but wait till you hear what didn't happen afterwards. So let's start from the beginning, right? Trish is out there with Zoe, top of the ramp. They're going back and forth with Becky, who's in the ring verbally. Trish was phenomenal before this match. Trish says, don't worry, I won't cheat you out of your rematch like the Astros. Calling the Astros cheaters. If you guys don't know, a few years ago, Astros win the title. The uh, They win the whole shebang, the whole championship. And the World Series belongs to the Astros. We come to find out that the reason they beat my Yankees and other teams, they were actually cheating. They created a... A really great system where they were able to know what pitches were coming, where that pitch was going, and where that ball was ultimately going. Um, They cheated. And it was a year where a lot of fans thought my Yankees were finally getting back there and we were this close. We got got beat at the very end by the Astros, who we found out were cheating, not just with the Yankees, but all the way to to their uh, championship. So... Uh, Trish Stratus just hit him hard and that got her electric booze. Now, there's been people that try to bring up the fan base of wherever they are hometown-wise. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's a cheap pop or a cheap boo. But the way Trish did it, right? She just dug in just a little deeper. She says it, she gets the booze, and then she's like, what? What are you... Bo-? Straight spitting facts, spitting facts, just spitting facts. She added on to it. Trish Stratus is phenomenal. It, it, I missed her so much from the Attitude Era. It's so good to see her today. A lot of today's wrestling fans, a lot of younger ones especially, they don't really get Trish. They think it's just a part-timer who's taking up a spot from somebody who, sh- who should be getting that shine. She adds so much value. 
She's so good, man. I, I talk about the, the, the two months ago when she was coming down and she asked the guy in the front row, is that your wife or girlfriend? He says, yeah. And she says, call me anyway. <laughs> to the fucking guy. It's those little things she does. Trish Stratus does that. Females, it's a lost art. They don't connect like that. She has fun out there. Man, it was so good to see that, man. Trish Stratus just having a lot of fun, man. Be fun, be being booted. Boo but booted. But she got booted. We'll talk about that in a second. She's being booed out of that arena, man. With that Houston Astros line. Love it. So they're going back and forth. She says, just not tonight. I'm not doing it in Houston, in, Houston, in Cheaterville. Not happening. Adam Pierce comes out, makes an impromptu match, as I aforementioned. Okay, we're thinking Schmazery set up SummerSlam. Immediately, the bell rings. The bell rings again because Zoe Starks interferes, causes a DQ. Becky wins the match. As fast as the bell started, it, it ended just as fast. It was like Bushwhacker Luke or Butch. I forgot which one. But, uh, it's Royal Rumble 91, was it? He comes in and he goes right out. I think Earthquake may have take, took, took him out or some shit. I don't know. But he got into the rumble and he got taken right out. I think that happened to Santino as well. Santino Morella. Or maybe it was Santina. I don't know. Somebody may have beaten Luke or Butch's record. But it reminded me of that. The bell rings. The bell rings again. Match on. Match over just as quickly. Zoe Stark and Trish Stratus putting a beating onto Becky Lynch. Um, And that's... That's when backstage, Adam Pierce, we thought was going to make the match for SummerSlam. He said in two weeks in Canada, two weeks in Canada makes sense. Obviously, I get it. Trish Stratus. But that means that that match that was pretty much penciled in for SummerSlam for weeks and weeks and weeks. It was just not made official yet. That means that match was DOS booted from the card. They're not going to do Trish Stratus and Becky. That's been feuding for months. You thought the culmination would obviously be at SummerSlam. You thought Becky Lynch would have a SummerSlam match. No. They booted the match from the card. Guys, that means that two big women's matches were taken off the card. So, Paul Levesque McMahon shredded the card, which you say, okay, less can be more, right? Shorten up the card, give the matches more time, it'll be more proper. Cool. But people are frustrated, confused, pissed off because they're saying, why was the two matches that were cut the women's matches? That's why a lot of the wrestling community, especially females, but a lot of people are just like, wow, two, one was for the title. Raquel and Rhea, the other one's been a few months in the making. Whether you want to see the match at SummerSlam, feel it should have been there or not, that's your prerogative. I get it, trust me. Like how I feel about Raquel at SummerSlam going for a title. I get it. But wow, that's a big call. Two female matches booted. Now, you got to ask yourself, does the Slim Jim Battle Royal get on the main card? And that's why these ladies' matches were booted. Or is that fit perfectly for the pre-show? Something like a Slim Jim Battle Royal, you would expect that at a pre-show. So let's say that that is on the pre-show. As of last night's marketing, they put that in with the other matches, guys. As of now, it's on the main show. But if you look at this card, and this is the first time I'm seeing it since last night's removal of those two big matches. So let's see together what this card even has. Uh, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight matches currently. If you include the Slim Jim Battle Royal, if you take it out, there's seven. With it, there's eight. The other seven matches, aside from the Slim Jim Battle Royal, Logan Paul versus Ricochet, Cody Rhodes versus Brock Lesnar, Ronda Rousey versus Shayna Baszler, MMA Rules. Gunther vs. Drew McIntyre, WWE IC title match, women's championship match, WWE women's championship match, Asuka, Charlotte, and Bianca, triple threat, undisputed WWE universal championship tribal combat match, say that 10 times fast, Roman Reigns vs. Jason Uso, and the WWE world heavyweight championship match, Sethington Rollins vs. Finn Balor. That's eight matches in total if you add the Slim Jim Battle Royal. That would also make one one out of the entire eight will be a women's match in the stadium of Detroit, 
SummerSlam, second biggest stage of the calendar year for this company. And only one women's match will be on that card unless they call an audible. That's why fans, a lot of fans were upset last night still to this day, man. Um, Wild to think about. Two women's matches pulled from the card. I wonder how you guys feel about that. Do you think the Slim Jim Battle Royal knocked them off? Or do you think the Slim Jim Battle Royal is still going to be in the pre-show? Massive decisions last night. Two big SummerSlam matches taken off the card. Again, you say BC, well, they weren't actually... They weren't officially penciled in, but those were two... We knew those were going to be SummerSlam matches. Obviously, one's a title. That has to be, unless they go an Austin Theory route and keep the title off of SummerSlam which is what they're doing. No United States title match. Because they're like, how are we going to pipe in booze with a stadium? So they left off the U.S. title. Now they're they're leaving off the WWE, or at least Rhea's championship. I don't know, man. That's wild. I couldn't believe they did that with Raquel. I had to give it like a... I was like, did I just hear that right? Am I missing something? Wait, what do you mean you're not cleared? And when you are, we will give you the match. But there is no SummerSlam match. And then segments later, just a few segments later, they're saying Trish and Becky will culminate in two weeks in Canada, not in Detroit, for SummerSlam. Wild turn of events for SummerSlam last night. Don't know how you guys feel about that. That is wild, man. The main event is what we go to next. Sethington Rollins and Sami Zayn versus Damian Priest and Dominic Mysterio. Sethington pins Senior Money in the Bank. That's not me saying that. Guys, that is a corny name that they have given Damian Priest. Senior Money in the Bank. They're selling shirts. Even Senior Money in the Bank wasn't wearing that shirt last night. He even knows. That is stupid. Senior Money in the Bank. Damian Priest is what we have to call him now. Um, He gets beat. Sethington just beats Senior Money in the Bank. Damian Priest via the stomp. Your Money in the Bank briefcase holder just loses like that. I can do better than that. There you go. Just like that, man. Uh, There was a moment where Priest goes to cash in his briefcase. Balor pauses before he hands it to Priest. He just throws. (laughs) It was hilarious. He's like, "Uh, uh, uh, what do I do? (laughs) It was great. Balor's staring at it like he's just amazed. He's staring at it like he's got fucking Tiffany Stratton's puppies in front of him. Like, oh, (laughs) what do I do? Field day. And Damien's like, give it to me, man. (laughs) Oh, but I don't know. It popped up. I don't know why that was such a funny moment. Like, Balor just froze like he's just staring at Tiffany Stratton's. Booyaka booyakas. It was just a great moment. He finally gives it to Damien, but by that point, Sethington super kicks the briefcase into the dome piece of Damien and then sets up for the stomp. Uh, So I thought it was a creative finish. The problem I have is that this is just the main event most weeks on Raw, right? You just interchange some parts. Sammy and Kevin Owens versus Imperium. Sammy and Kevin Owens versus Judgment Day. Sammy and Kevin Owens versus Damien and Dominic. Or Balor and Dominic, or Balor and Damian. Um, Matt Riddle with Sami Zayn or Kevin Owens, or in a six-man tag with Judgment Day. Sethington Rollins with Owens and Zayn in a six-man with Judgment Day, or you just make it a straight-up tag team match. My point is, you're just interchanging the parts every fucking Monday Night Raw. Guys, at what point is it just... It's so redundant that it's boring. So, with some... Big headline things happening last night. The main event, once again, and I feel this way most weeks for Raw, by the time we get to the main event, I'm so bored with the main event. Guys, I would have been more, I would have been more okay if the night ended with the Ronda Rousey, Shayna Baszler package. Screw it. At least that's captivating. I would have been more okay laughing my ass off at Brock Lesnar once again breaking the arm of Cody Rhodes. Fuck it. At least it's something. <laughs> Um, I, I, Gunther ending, the, just, I, I don't know, something different. Every week, it's a weird Judgment Day tag match with something to do with Owens and Zayn and their non-existent title reign because it's a non-existent tag team division. We gotta do better with the endings of Raw, the finishes, man. Really devote time to a cliffhanger that makes you not just want to watch next week, but you got a big pay-per-view five days away at that point. Now it's four nights away. 
We didn't get that last night, but what a wild, a lot of, man, there was good, right? Logan Paul and Ricochet really enjoying that work. Looking forward to that match, actually. Pretty excited about that match. Ronda and Baszler, wow, did they make us care, or at least a lot of us made us care about that by just devoting some time. You just do that in a video package. You know, you, same thing with AEW, man. Sometimes when Jim Ross, still to this day, just sits down with somebody and has a real good interview, man, it could sell you, right? So uh, even I'm, I'm even praising Ronda and Shayna, and they weren't even really at the, in the arena doing a segment out in the crowd. Or for the crowd. So you had some good for sure Gunther, man. Man. He was, he's been booked oddly the past several months. Just having like long matches and not really feeling special. Last night he felt special. So there was some good, man. And then there's just some big headlines. Like two major SummerSlam matches that were going to be booted. Das booted from the card. Cody gets his arm broken again, basically. Um, the tension is there once again within Judgment Day. Oh, I was going to give you the briefcase. I froze. I don't know what happened. Ate some chili beans. <laughs> Something was going on. <laughs> uh, I don't know, man. So, I don't know. That was Monday Night Raw, Hour 3. That was the go-home show. That was it. Now it's SummerSlam. The, the, the time for that, done. SummerSlam is Saturday night. Um, Detroit, Michigan. Um, seven matches or eight, depending on if they're going to give the Slim Jim Battle Royal, on, uh, put that onto the show. And uh, two big ladies matches booted. As of the recording of this, maybe by the time you watch this, WWE.com announces, you know what? We changed our mind. We're clearing Raquel. Who knows? So that's the review that I got for you guys. Now, I want to go over to, uh, before I end the podcast, man, um, some super chat, super thanks from yesterday's NXT review. Big shout out to everybody that caught that. You might not even know that I put up a review. First of all, it was on a Sunday. And secondly, it's an NXT review, which I don't usually do. My rule is you got to pull at least a million in viewership consistently on your shows. I'll review your show. AEW, NXT, they really don't do that, so I can't really review their their product. But um, I wanted to give you guys a big salute, show some appreciation, and, and give you guys a bonus. I caught Great American Bash. I said, let's do a review. Let's do an amplified review. It wasn't that long. So if you got a little bit of time, catch it. Um, and I want to do the same thing for AEW, maybe all in, right? I want to give a, a review for them too. Even though they're not pulling a million on any of their shows, I still uh, I want to show that support to the AEW fan base that watches BC as well, just like the NXT. So, big salute to everybody that caught that NXT review yesterday. There were some super thankses, including JR9 Gaming's take on Great American Bash. We're going to go over the positives and negatives. And real quick, on a previous uh, podcast that I did not catch the super thankses uh, up front, I want to give a shout out over to, to WWE AEW Marvel fan. Appreciate that super thanks on a previous podcast. WWE AEW Marvel fan Kevin MD uh, much appreciation on that super thanks from a previous podcast and Ashley Ashley I appreciate the super thanks previous podcast not sure exactly which one uh, but I do recall those I appreciate that for yesterday's super thanks which I do have fresh here first I want to start with Angel Olega bro a 25 spot mini banger bomb in the Super Chat Super, that thanks button down below. It's never needed. It's always appreciated. You want to tip the content creator. Much love and appreciation. Respect right back. But it's never needed. And Angel Olega drops a $25 mini banger bomb in the Super Thanks of yesterday's NXT Great American Bash review. So when I caught that, I was like, bro. And that's a gold card member, Angel, by the way. Channel member already showing the utmost of appreciation. He says, thanks, BC. Celebrating six-month membership with a mini bomb. Great match in the main event. And Tiffany Stratton at 24 is so good already with the best moonsault in the business. So again, Angel, I appreciate the mini banger bomb, bro. And I appreciate the six-month membership just as much, if not way more. Uh, because that's the ultimate level of respect. So, Angel, right back to you, dude. 
And I completely agree. I don't know who's got a better moonsault. I can't think of it. Tiffany Stratton just gets better and better. And she lands right into the pin. EO would have been the best before I saw Stratton's. EO's is still up there. EO Shirai, EO Sky. But yeah, absolutely. And the, the main event, fully agree. I, I call it a match of the year candidate. Easily in the top 10. It's most likely going to be narrowed into the top five. There's still several months left to go. And uh, we'll see what I have as uh, as the match of the year. But that main event for NXT, Carmelo and Dragunov. Wow, did they do the deed. Angel Olega, salute, bro. Appreciate you big time. Kim T with a two spot. Super thanks. Super chat says, I went to the Great American Bash and it was a blast to see it live. The crowd cheered for Baron and chanted, you ain't angle. You ain't angle at Gable Stevenson. I love the triple threat and the weapons wild, and I was rooting for Dragonoff to win, but Mello was great. Crowd seemed like they were into it. BC enjoyed the show. I said at worst it was decent. At best, good. That was absolutely a good show. I wish there was a little bit more special features on it um, because this was a standalone on a Sunday night. A little bit more surprises, some more special features on it, but man, the matches... Roxy delivering, Tiffany Stratton, uh, she got exhausted toward the end there, but Tiffany Stratton retaining was the right call. Match of the year candidate with Dragunov and Mello. Tony D hoisting up a championship, and uh, yeah, the triple threat match delivered as well. Uh, Wes Lee taking the L from Dominic, ooh, second time. I don't know about that one. But yeah, Kim T, I'm glad you enjoyed it, dude. I enjoyed watching it. That's for damn sure. Um, Silver Black, 31 with a two spot. Super thanks, Coffee. Unfortunately, when I watch wrestling, it's in the background. But I did stop what I was doing to catch Roxanne Perez, Roxy, versus Blair Davenport. Very good women's hardcore match. Yes, it was t- titled Weapons Wild, for those of you that didn't catch it. Um, Isla Dragunov versus Carmelo was Melo's best match in NXT, dragging off his best match since, since Gunther, and Gabe vs. Baron, because that was the worst debut ever. Something ain't right when Corbin gets cheered so much. I started busting out laughing at work. Yeah, from Silver Black 31, first of all, salute, brother. I appreciate the super thanks as always, man. That's a gold status as well, Silver Black 31, channel member. Um, But yeah, if you guys didn't catch it, the crowd was actually cheering Baron for a portion of this match because Stevenson just doesn't connect. And there's going to have to be more than, okay, I'm just a really good amateur wrestler, so love me. There's got to be more. Otherwise, you're a bootleg. You're not even in the conversation of bootleg dollar store or dollar general version of Kurt Angle. You're not even a bootleg at that point. There's just no care, period. So I I said two dudes that lack a lot of charisma and personality like Baron and and Stevenson, and you're going to put them together. That's risky. And sure enough, man, everybody was kind of laughing at the end of that. And, and poor Steveson, he was put in a position where they're yelling, they're chanting, you ain't angle. So they're already just making a comparison like he's a bull. Yeah, it's rough, man. Silver Black 31, salute. Appreciate you, dude. Um, If I missed any, I do uh, apologize up front. Um, I think I got the most there. I, wanted, I want Jar9 Gaming. Two spot, obviously, super thanks, Coffee. But this is the JR9's NXT Roundup for Great American Bash. JR9 says the NXT Roundup has made its way to the greatest unit in the world for the Great American Bash pay per view. Let's do it. Let me get a swig and we'll go over JR9 Gaming's review of NXT. JR9 labels the positives. Tony D and Stax winning the tag titles from Gallus was a solid way to start. The best built stories in NXT had to be going in... Oh, it was the best built stories in NXT going into it. And on the night delivered the correct culmination with the D'Angelo family getting gold, which was long overdue. The match should have gotten more time, but the main thing was getting the title change. I said the exact same thing in my review, Jar9. I said it was clear there was one purpose and one purpose only. Get those titles on Tony D. Stacks, go along for the ride. But Tony D... Hoisting up a title. That's how they wanted to start that show. So I feel the same exact way. And maybe a little bit more substance into the match. Anyway, this isn't BC's review. This is JR9. 
So keep spitting that shit, bro. Jared Nine says, with the positives, Roxy versus Blair was one hell of a match. Both delivered, even though I still believe they could have done slightly more. Regardless, a very good weapons wild match. Blair hiding in the crowd to ambush Roxy during her entrance was a nice touch. So was Blair mocking Roxanne's mother and young sister, making the sister cry. Very good heel work. Roxy winning was the correct call after a few recent losses for her. Yeah, there was no way Davenport could beat Roxy that way in Texas in front of mama and sister. And what Jar9 is saying, by the way, the sister actually was like crying. It was, it was part of the show. It wasn't the greatest cry job, but I mean, she did her best to actually try to cry for her sister that was getting beat up by Davenport. I thought that was wild, too. Uh, Going on with the positives, Dragunov versus Mello was fantastic. A 25-minute classic. Easily Mello's best win slash match of his career in a match of the year contender. Unreal chemistry. Dragunov delivering one of the greatest sells of all time to a catching code breaker. Really good. At first, I thought it was delayed too much, but then I saw Dragunov ricochet off in the cell, and I was like, beautiful. That was a perfectly timed delay. So I love that code break. I don't think I even mentioned that in my review, so good uh, good call there, Jaron. Mello countering a top rope suplex into a cutter looked great. That as well. Good call, Jaron. And of course, Dragunov's Superman punch was epic. Dude, that was an easy one, two, three, I thought. Rocked when Mello got that shoulder up. Best NXT title match on since NXT Portland 2020 Champa Adam Cole. Big statement there, Jaron. Dragunov showed why he is the best wrestler in the world today, at least for me. He is the perfect man to dethrone Gunther, if you ask me, and easily could be built to be the man to dethrone Roman. He's that believable. Completely agree. This dude, you use the word believable. I know size-wise, he ain't the biggest, not even close, but man, is he the most believable. One of the most badass dudes in pro wrestling today. Um... Small detail, but having neither finisher get kicked out of in a 25-minute war was something I loved. That's how you make them actually feel like well finishers. We need more matches to be that way instead of new uh, the new trend of constant finisher kickouts for a cheap pop from the crowd. Couldn't agree more. I say this all the time. I think it really started with HBK and Undertaker, WrestleMania 25. That match was so good that everybody started to try to emulate it, right? Oh, let's do a bunch of near-fall finishes off of our finishers. And you can't do it all the time. And they wore it out. And now everybody thinks that that's just how you wrestle. And that's why finishers don't mean anything. And that's why you just see more and more fruit roll-ups. Because nobody cares at that point. Completely agree. Jaronine's negatives. Steveson versus Corbin was awful. Crowd rejected Steveson's ch- uh, <laughs> crowd rejected Steveson chanting "You're not Angle" while cheering for Baron. A double countout finish for a pay per view match is horrendous. Just a complete waste of time. Plus, Gable looked very generic with little personality or charisma. I can't see him succeeding after one of the worst debuts of all time. I basically share those same sentiments in my review of that match. And it's sad to say that. And I hope he finds some type of the it factor. But if it ain't in him, he's going to have a rough road. Um, Wasn't a fan of Stratton versus Hale. Just felt like a TV match that was very sloppy for a world title match. Putting both of them in a submission match was a poor decision. As neither were ready or suited for that kind of a match. I felt that was very odd. Very odd. And by the end, Stratton was just a little shooken up. I know she got dropped on her dome piece a couple of times from Hale earlier, especially that suplex from the top rope. But I also just feel she was exhausted. So by the time she was in the busted crap, she was like, just let this over with. (laughs) Probably not the best cardio you want to see for something like a submission match. And I don't know if Hale was the right person for it either. I agree on that, Jaron. Um, looks like a third match is happening as well as Hale didn't tap, which is exactly what we don't need. Yep. Andre Chase threw in the red towel, not the white. They may make a storyline out of that. North American title, triple threat was pointless. Dom and Rhea using heel tactics to hide a title belt shot on, 
uh, title shot on Wes from the ref, which well makes no sense as it is no DQ anyways. So hiding the sh- hiding the shot made no difference. Oh, the camera shot? Or from the ref, uh, I don't know. R- Rhea putting Wes through a table, then pulling Ali off the cover, allowing Dom to pin Wes again wasn't good. I'm fed up with Rhea beating up the men. It's getting really overdone. Yeah, there was a lot of action. The crowd enjoyed the match live. Um, but I cannot agree more. I mean, you heard my review on it. It's Wes Lee just taking an L to Dominic to end the match on a frog splash. But yeah, I didn't even think to, to go over the... That, that's true what you're saying too with the title belt. And it is no DQ because it's triple threat anyway. So yeah, good point there too. I It was pointless when they announced it. We know that. Dominic being there is pointless. <laughs> this, is where they, this is where they're going, bro. JC on Friday announced she was going to the Great American Bash to raise hell, but she was brought all the way to Texas for a 15-second backstage segment, brawling with Lyra, wasting her talents once again. Like, if you're going to brawl, have JC take over the show, calling her out to the ring, and they have a fun brawl all around the arena. That would have been so much more effective. I saw that. I, I was happy for you, Jeremiah, that JC was on the show, and you blinked, and it was over. And I was like, dude, I can't even put that into the review. There's nothing to talk about. JC had a backstage brawl real quick. That's not even worthy to be put into the review. So it was so... I couldn't put it in, Jeremiah. And I was like, oh, man. Because I knew you were pumped that she was going to be a part of the show. I had a feeling that would make the negatives. Um, when, the fu- when the 55 second threat warning of going to the show. When the 55 second threat warning of going to the show is actually longer than the segment. It's a massive botch. Oh yeah, <laughs> her telling you she's going to show up and wreak havoc. And the backstage segment is lesser than her telling you she's showing up. It's a massive botch. JC versus Valkyra was announced for Tuesday's NXT. JC needs to win, but unfortunately, I just can't see it happening. Overall, the pay-per-view was a mixed bag. Good opening 40 minutes, then a really poor middle of the show. But a fantastic main event pretty much saved the event. Definitely was nowhere near the quality of every other NXT pay-per-view this year. Hopefully, No Mercy is better. I believe that is, mm, I want to say Saturday, but it could be Sunday, but it's September 30th. I believe that's a Saturday. I think that's the next NXT pay-per-view. No Mercy. September 30th, I believe, guys. Jaron, great review, brother. I shared the same sentiments basically on all of it, man. Um, At its worst, decent. At its best, good. Great, nowhere near. Main event, yes, <laughs> for sure. Rest of the event, I'll easily give you a good. And uh, and I think that's justified. Jaranine, kick ass, brother. Enjoyed the review fully. And to my amplified unit, kept you here long enough. What a podcast, man. It was packed, stacked, and jacked. And now BC's got to go get even more jacked. And we're going to rock out the rest of today. You guys do the same. Until next time. And there will be a next time. Top guy, I'm out. BC saying check you.